singing and dancing in the cruelest month, a reflection on theology and poetry in a time of COVID. In the extraordinary and powerful dialogue, Proverbs of Ashes, in which Rita Nakashima Brock and Rebecca Ann Parker tell of their experience of violence and abuse, and of what kind of theology will and will not meet such experiences. Parker writes this, I did not defeat negative feelings of anguish and despair because I saw something more lovely and good. Rather, I became able to feel more. My feeling broadened. Pain, sadness and despair were not eliminated or overcome. I embraced them with a larger heart. That beautifully describes what I see as the contribution of the arts to the current COVID crisis. No poem, painting, sculpture or sonata, however lovely and good, will eliminate the huge experience of loss that so many have experienced in such a range of ways, from the actual loss of relatives who joined care home statistics without ever having the chance to hold for a last time the hand of someone they loved, to the huge loss of opportunities this time represents, so evidently for those in formal education and graduates looking for first jobs, but at every stage of careers and life journeys, there are losses of possibility that are hard to process, let alone overcome. And no dance or drum solo can dissipate altogether our fear, the underlying anxiety of the time. But the best, the most excellent of artistic productions, can I believe enlarge the heart in a way that fits us better to embrace the uncertainty and tragedy of this epidemic and find within it also ingredients of future wisdom and hope, ingredients that may go beyond what could have been thought before. What has happened has happened. It is not defeated by appeal to art, but perhaps it may be woven with the aid of the finest of what human spirit and ingenuity can contrive into a larger imaginative story. And that I suggest has been the characteristic response of the people of God to disasters, as we see in particular in the response of the Israelites to successive defeats and ultimately exile in Babylon. New songs were sung in the strange land laments of extraordinary ferocity, pathos and power, but also new cosmologies were devised that helped the people embrace their situation and reframe it within a larger story. That may be an unfamiliar way to read the first chapter of the Bible as a response forged in the crucible of defeat, disaster, loss of all stability, and horrendous uncertainty about the future. But I invite you next time you read it to consider it as a way to encourage the people of God into an enlargement of the heart. My chosen art form to discuss in this essay is poetry. And I shall use three poems to illustrate my thesis. The first was published in 1922 formed out of the experience of the horrendous loss of life, not only in the First World War, but in the Spanish flu epidemic. The second was published in 2001, but refers back to the Irish famine of 1847. The third has been written in the last couple of months. My mother once said to me, I wonder how poetry works. And of course, we can come up with easy answers that the devices of poetry, especially rhyme and assonance, rhythm and cadence, take words into the human spirit via our neurophysiology. I'm irresistibly reminded of that scene in the Dead Poet Society when the teacher explains iambic metre simply by having the class walk together around a courtyard. 
and once on what seems a day from a whole world away on the road to Compostela I taught a teenager pentameter in a square at sunset simply by pointing out that he had just been speaking in it. Rhythm is deep in our bodies, in our heartbeat, in our circadian patterns, rhythm and broken rhythm and our visceral reaction to the music of words lies behind our deep and largely unconscious response to the speech and gestures of others. Perhaps these reflexes are vitiated by the bombardment of stimuli in our present urban and digital environments. We do not sit easily through day-long declamations of oral poetry. We do not, as the ancient Athenians did, consume three Greek tragedies at a sitting. It is hard to concentrate through the longer Shakespearean plays at the Globe, even if the helicopters are going the other way that day. But the responses are still there in our bodies and our spirits. And perhaps there are signs that people again want poetry for times when they crave most intensely enlargement of the heart at weddings and funerals and in our present eerie isolation. So it's perhaps ironic having talked of the natural rhythms in our bodies to turn for my first example to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. One of the most intriguing of Ezra Pound's annotations of Eliot's typescript is where he writes two penty against a line. At a number of other junctures too, Pound seeks to deconstruct the classic rhythms into which he saw Eliot straying. As Marshall McLuhan noted, Eliot's original his typescript with Pound's annotations and the final wasteland are three very different poems. The eventual product of Pound's Caesarean operation is an extraordinary poem that certainly takes no prisoners in its constant shift of tone and narrative. Though Eliot himself called it just a piece of rhythmical grumbling, its intricately structured disarray is widely acknowledged to echo the disintegration and loss occasioned by the World War. It refuses the consolations of iambic pentameter. It refuses to be something beautiful and good to look at or inhabit. But for so many, in almost a hundred years, it has fought its way through the bafflement of the interpreter to enlarge the heart. What I had not seen until asked to write this lecture was that the wasteland can also be seen as a post-pandemic poem. There is little direct evidence for this. Eliot mentioned Spanish flu only once during the main outbreak. But the period of early gestation of the wasteland, the year 1918, was marked by the flu epidemic brought back to the UK by returning troops. A quarter of the population may have been affected and 228,000 people died. The worldwide death toll is thought to have been 50 million. Some who began to feel ill in the morning were dead by the late afternoon. Unlike COVID, Spanish flu was at its most pathogenic in young adults. Elliot was thus in the high risk group and commuted daily into London through the summer of 1918. We know also from his letters that his health and his wife's was a constant preoccupation. Impossible then that the incidence of influenza did not form an important part of his consciousness at this time. Both Eliot seem to have had the virus in December 1918 during the second wave of the epidemic. He writes after recovering that it still left him very weak and worrying himself about his mind not acting as it used to do. Since I drafted this essay, my attention has been drawn to Elizabeth Utka's 2019 study, Viral Modernism, which makes the same connection between the wasteland and Spanish flu. 
one does not have to agree with all Lutka's readings to accept her overall thesis that the flu epidemic is an influence on the wasteland hiding in plain sight, and that the poem possesses a kind of delirium logic attendant on fever and surrounding death. In our current plight, we can feel with a new intensity the lines, unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge so many, I had not thought death had undone so many. In her recent address, the Queen told us that the streets were not empty. They were filled with the love and the care that we have for each other. But Eliot sees something different. He sees in the empty streets the profusion of the dead. It's a very important image as our sensibilities are dulled by statistics and we start to regard only a few hundred dead in a day as positive news. Eliot's fourth line quotes book three of the Inferno of his beloved Dante. London is now the lobby area of hell itself. The Wasteland is first and foremost a poem of loss. From its very first line, April is the cruelest month, which evokes Tennyson's In Memoriam. And a poem of disconnection with its staccato narrative style that speaks of the shattering of the assumptions that informed the pre-war Western world. At this time of so much loss, when we struggle to say, stay connected, and even to sustain any sort of shared narrative of what should be happening to us. It is a profound experience to lose ourselves again in the kaleidoscope that is the wasteland. And strikingly, astonishingly, at the end of the last section, what the thunder said, Eliot turns the kaleidoscope faster and faster through nursery rhyme, purgatorio, poetry, drama, and Sanskrit scripture. And we arrive at the astonishing last line, Shanti, 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 which Eliot himself paraphrased as the peace that passeth understanding. Beyond what the thunder says, in the sound of sheer silence Elijah heard on the mountain, can be discerned a peace that will not never let us go. Peace is not argued for any more than joy is argued for in the rite of spring or wisdom in Rodin's Penseur. It emerges out of concentration of effect, the auditory imagination honed to an extraordinary degree. The assumption shattering, the disconnection, is faced with honesty that is sometimes savage, and yet the heart is enlarged. It may be argued that The Wasteland is by no means a Christian poem in the way that Eliot's later work from Journey of the Magi onwards so evidently is. But Lyndall Gordon's work has helped us to see just what a deep spiritual searcher the Eliot of this period was. Indeed, she writes that he had a capacity rare in his time to imagine living by visions. However, Pound's surgery meant that by the time Eliot produced the final draft of The Wasteland, the dream of sainthood had almost wholly disappeared. Eliot, Gordon writes, was forced to rewrite his saint's life in more explicit forms in Ash Wednesday and Four Quartets. But I part company with Gordon over her disappointment that in the climax of the poem, What the Thunder Said, plainer language of Christian pilgrimage was abandoned so that the thunder now rumbles obscure Sanskrit words. Behind those three thunderous words, data, dayadvam, damyata, lie spiritual imperatives with deep Christian associations. Data, give, or surrender the self with that most profoundly Christic of movements, 
that of kenosis. The yadvam, not so much human sympathy as a kind of receptivity to intimations and signs. He who has eyes to see, let him see, as the Gospels have it. Let him bear reality, in Eliot's later phrase, in Burnt Norton and murder in the cathedral. Damyata, control the self, the last of Paul's lists of the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5, and hence in a sense standing for the whole list. And what a powerful combination that remains for the pilgrim through this Covid time, looking beyond the immediate interests of the self, seeking to read to the full the signs of these strange times, working with the surges of fear, anxiety and stress so that they do not destroy the self in its relationships, but allow it to bear the fruit of love, joy and peace. The wasteland wins through to the promise of the peace that passes understanding found not in retreat from the kaleidoscope of feelings and sensations, but in its center, which Eliot was later to glimpse as the still point of the turning world. The second poem I've chosen is Quarantine by the Irish poet Evan Boland, who has very recently died. It is set in the potato famine of the 1840s and it tells the story of two Irish peasants forced to leave the workhouse because one of them has one of the array of infections that went collectively by the name of famine fever. I'll read it for you now. In the worst hour of the worst season of the worst year of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking, north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that west and north until at nightfall under freezing stars they arrived. In the morning they were both found dead of cold, of hunger of the toxins of a whole history, but her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory their death together in the winter of 1847. Also what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and a woman, and in which darkness it can best be proved. To me, this is a poem of almost unbearable poignancy, and it feels like an offense even to offer any commentary. Again, one could talk about the poet's craft, the way she uses clumped stresses to avoid easy natural rhythm, her incantatory use of repetition. More powerful still is the architecture of the poem, how she draws us close into the narrative, as close as the last heat of the man's flesh, and moves austerely away into the tones of the prophet. Love can be proved in the worst hour of the worst year, in the darkness that is near to death. And again, anguish and despair are not vanquished in the poem, but we are allowed to feel that love has a largeness of heart, even in defeat and death, that can be proved and can endure. This poem has for us at present an additional ironic quality that fosters, at least in me, a deep and painful longing. The woman's feet are held against the man's breastbone. The last heat of his flesh 
was his last gift to her. Touch, the pressure of another's flesh, the warmth of another's blood through skin on skin, is so often denied at present, even to the dying. This virus that is costing so much is also depriving us of precious moments of touch, the value of which is incalculable. There are too heavy echoes of the issues of justice that also lurk behind our own present crisis in the phrase, the toxins of our whole history. As is often pointed out at present, the toxins of a deeply unequal society sustained on individualism and consumption are exacerbating the suffering brought by the virus. By an especially bitter twist, the brunt has been borne not only by the most vulnerable in terms of age and previous health, but also by racial minorities who so often have been the object of prejudice and discrimination. So quarantine is a poem to sit with in these times, to let its feeling and its prophecy work in hearts so much in need of enlargement. I'm going to offer one more poem, which stems directly from this strangest of Easter's. The priest poet Malcolm Geit has made a major contribution to Christian poetry recently especially in his sonnet collection, Sounding the Seasons. Geit's ability to work with theological themes and using the resources of meter and rhyme are a delight to many. Here is his reflection on this Easter day. Easter 2020. And where is Jesus this strange Easter day? not lost in our locked churches any more than he was sealed in that dark sepulchre. The locks are loosed, the stone is rolled away, and he is up and risen long before, alive at large and making his strong way into the world he gave his life to save. No need to seek him in his empty grave. He might have been a wafer in the hands of priests this day, or music from the lips of red-robed choristers. Instead, he slips away from church, shakes off our linen bands, to don his apron with a nurse. He grips and lifts a stretcher, soothes with gentle hands the frail flesh of the dying, gives them hope, breathes with the breathless, lends them strength to cope. On Thursday, we applauded, for he came and served us in a thousand names and faces, mopping our sick room floors and catching traces of that corona which was death to him. Good Friday happened in a thousand places where Jesus held the helpless, died with them, that they might share his Easter in their need. Now they are risen with him, risen indeed. Pentameter resurrected. Geit's prosody is in the lineage of Shakespeare and Herbert rather than the high modernism of Eliot and Powell. But this is pentameter used with a flexibility and sinuousness that speaks of a poet exploring, bending his mind around material that is so weighty that, to revert for a moment to Eliot, Words strain, crack, and sometimes break under the burden, under the tension, slip, slide, perish, decay with imprecision, will not stay in place, will not stay still. Geit's poem is not poetic thought that is condensed into the formal rigor of the sonnet. Its texture is open, its thought will not stay still, rather its movement takes us on and on, into the intensity of Jesus' solidarity with the beleaguered and dying, and then into a simple resolving comfort. The last line, I think, shows Geit's great skill with tone and cadence. The acclamation, Christ is risen, 
he is risen indeed, alleluia, is the church's proclamation at its most triumphal. It is the shout of the new age dawning. And as a number of theologians of trauma remarked, the univocal proclamation of victory and triumph of the old has passed away and the wineskins full of the wine of heaven. That proclamation sits awkwardly, sometimes unbearably, with the experience of the traumatized and those who are, for whatever reason, immured in their suffering. Geit's last line is sure of the resurrection and the life, but there is no hallelujah to it. The rhyme of Geit's couplet tells us that God has met the need of the helpless and the dying, but the cadence tells us that this meeting is a muted one. It is enough, but it doesn't shout as so much Christian worship has done in the past in the faces of those who grieve unbearable loss. Still, the completeness of the sentiment, the assurance of the last line, will bother some. For some, even this delicate exploration will seem too certain of itself. I think, however, that this poem functions somewhat like those psalms of lament that end in confession of praise. The ancient Israelite hymn writers knew the grieving of the heart and its enlargement, and that sometimes to sing out what we cannot yet feel can be part of our healing, part of staying in register with the cosmic song of the ever mysterious God. We can rehearse those psalmic endings as we can Geit's concluding couplet, and their poetry can help us feel that anguish and despair, frustration and anger and fear of the future are all held within a larger story. There is an argument that having chosen to talk about poetry in the context of theology and the COVID crisis, I should merely have devoted the entire talk to the lament psalms in the Hebrew Bible. To live with the Psalter, with its honesty at anguish and despair and anger and frustration and praise and joy and pain and sadness is itself to be offered resources for resilience of heart that are all too sorely needed at this time. As it happens, I've also been living first with Dietrich Bonhoeffer's prison poems and more recently with Barrows and Macy's remarkable translation of Rilke's Book of Hours. We may be beset by furious overactivity at this strange time, but there is the opportunity also to go deeper into the interior life, or rather to let that life be itself and allow its resources to change us. Rilke writes, when gold is in the mountains and we've ravaged the depths till we've given up digging, it will be brought forth into day by the river that mines the silences of stone. One last thought before I end. In my most recent book, Theology in a Suffering World, I tried to persuade the reader that the natural world as created by God is a deeply ambiguous place. It shows us the amazingly in intricate life strategies that have evolved over billions of years, the sprint of the cheetah, the stoop of the peregrine falcon, and yes, ingenious strategies of pathogens. Too many commentators in the barnstorm of blogs and opinion pieces and self-help streams that has characterized the last two months have wanted to slide over God's ultimate responsibility for this sort of world. A more honest theology, one truer to the Psalms and those reframers of Israelite faith in the disaster of the exile, recognizes that ultimately God is the maker of weal and woe alike in the natural world. Though of course our own hubris and folly have a huge part to play in our suffering. We can long for God, 
and sing God's songs, but we should do so recognizing the ambiguous character of God's creation. Grasping that God's world is not only the world of lovely powerpoints of sunsets over mountains and oceans, but also of predation and parasitism, <coughs> is like the shift in aesthetic required to appreciate Stravinsky's Rite of Spring in Majinsky's revolutionary choreography after being schooled in the appreciation of classical ballet. The dancers had to be taught to dance on their heels instead of their points. To ground our contemplation of the natural world on a real appreciation of the ambiguous character of that world is to be forced back on our heels by the weight of its reality, but therefore to dance in a more grounded way. It is always then the calling of those who would learn from the natural world to learn to dance on our heels. In this cruelest of springs, it is also part of the calling of human beings to sing the songs the poets offer us and thereby enlarge hearts that have grown all too familiar with pain and sadness and despair. <clears throat>